Hello everybody and welcome to your Unit 1 Lesson 4. Today we are still sticking with our astronomy unit and we are going to be covering something called Kepler's Laws as well as going over a review of the planets in our solar system. So these first few slides here, this presentation is linked in Canvas. Um, also, before you move forward, make sure that you've gone into Canvas and downloaded your interactive notebook slides for today because your guided notes are located in those slides and that's what this presentation corresponds with. So make sure you've downloaded those before you go any further. These first few slides here, so um, slides one through six, are a review from yesterday. They're there just to help you in case you need them. Um, they're the same info from yesterday, just like phrased in a different way in case that will help you. But we are starting your notes for today's lesson from um, slide seven. Okay, so again, you're not going to find notes for slides one through six because it's just a review from yesterday. So we're starting with our new stuff on slide seven. So let's go ahead and jump into it. So right now, I just want to review the planets in our solar system because this should be a review from middle school, but you know, sometimes we forget things. So it's good to um, kind of go over this information again. So before we move on to Kepler's laws, we just need to be able to name the planets in our solar system. Um, we need to be able to identify the largest planet, the smallest planet, the planet that's the closest to the Earth's size, and then also to identify the shape of the path of the planet's orbit. So getting started, you guys have a diagram with the planets that you can fill in. You should be able to click into those text box and fill them in. So on the very left hand side we've got our Sun which is very massive. Our Sun contains most of the actual matter in our solar system. And then starting from the beginning we've got Mercury followed by Venus followed by Earth which is our planet, we're the third from the sun, then Mars, and then Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So if you guys notice, there is no Pluto. Um, I'm pretty sure that you were babies. Probably maybe babies are just being born when NASA decided that Pluto was no longer a planet. So it's still considered a dwarf planet, but it's not considered one of the um, major planets in our solar system anymore because it was just too small and it didn't have enough criteria to, to maintain its planetary status. Um, so something just to be aware of, these first four planets here are called terrestrial planets because they're rocky and they have solid solid crusts in them that you could, you know, potentially stand on. Now these these planets don't support life, but if you were to move through their atmosphere and land on them, you would be able to stand on solid ground. And then our last four planets, Jupiter through Neptune, they're referred to as the gas giants because they are composed mostly of gases. So here's a way that you can just remember our planets. Um, it's a little saying and it does include the P for Pluto, but we just need to be aware that Pluto is not technically um, one of the recognized planets in our solar system. So the way that you can remember the order of the planets, my very eager mother just served us nine pizzas. Okay, and again, the P stands for Pluto. Um, the only letter that's repeated is the M's. So we just have to remember that Mercury is first and then Mars. So Mercury comes first and then Mars. And then just a couple other things about the planets we need to be aware of. Mercury is the smallest planet. It's the one closest to the sun. Venus, the one that's closest to us on our left-hand side. I guess if you could say there's a left-hand side. If you're looking at the diagram, Venus is next to us on the left. Um, Venus is the closest in size to Earth. Okay. Um, and then Mars is referred to as the red planet. It does have a red hue. And then Jupiter is our largest planet. Jupiter is one of the gas giants and it is our largest. Um, and then Saturn has very distinct rings. So you can always recognize Saturn by the rings around the planet. And planet, the planets are pretty interesting if you ever wanted to look up just some fun facts about them. Um, but all we really need to know is the order from the sun and also the ones that are bolded here. 
So now that we've reviewed our planets, we're going to jump into Kepler's laws today. And um, a law is something that really can be proven mathematically and scientifically. So if something is referred to as a law in um, science, it's something that has been proven time and time again. And so it's accepted as factual. So these laws are going to be something that all planets follow in the solar system. So we also have to talk about gravity today. And what is gravity? And what's the big deal about gravity? Why is it important? Well, first of all, gravity is the attraction between every two objects, no matter how big or how small. Okay, so gravity works on all of us. If we look at this pyramid here, it says gravity of the Earth pulls objects towards the center of the planet. Okay, because that's where the center of the mass is. So the reason that we don't float off into space is because gravity pulls us to the center of the planet. When astronauts leave the atmosphere and they go into space, they escape Earth's gravity. So that gravity does not work on them anymore and it doesn't pull them down and so they can float in their spaceships because there's no gravity there. And gravity is different on other planets as well. So if you were to go to um, a different planet and you were able to get out and walk on that planet, depending on how attractive the gravitational forces, you would maybe feel a lot heavier than you do here on Earth. So what does that mean? So gravity is actually the cause for nutation. And remember, we learned about nutation yesterday. So gravity is the cause for that wobbling back and forth. And just a reminder, a nutation happens every 18 years, and it's the wobble of the planet on its axis. So if we're looking at this, this right here is the precession of our axis. So it's where it goes in this oval shape and changes the, the location of the stars in the night sky, or the perception of the location of the stars. And then the movement here, the wobbling back and forth, this wave pattern, that's the nutation. That is gravity, so due to gravity. Okay, so gravity is causing that wobbling on the axis. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about the three laws that govern how planets move around a sun. So we're going to talk about Kepler's laws. And Johannes Kepler, he was a mathematician and he was also an astronomer that was able to use math to determine these very complex equations and come up with how the planets actually behave as they're in orbit around the sun. So his first law is really easy. The first law states that planets move in an elliptical orbit, and we know that an elliptical path is an oval. Okay, we've already talked about that. And we know that an orbit is a planet's path around, um, for today we're talking about the sun, but the orbit is any object's path around another object. But today we're going to be talking about objects around the sun. So if we're looking at this here, our sun is yellow, and here we have a planet. It doesn't matter which planet it is because they all follow an oval. Now some of them, depending on how far away they are, will have larger elliptical orbits, so larger areas that they have to move around the sun, but they will all follow this same shape. Okay, so Kepler's first law, Planets move in an elliptical orbit. I'm going to skip over this because this is something we would do together in class, but we're not together. So first law states that planets move in an oval shape, so an elliptical around the object, around the sun. Now the second law states that a planet travels faster when it's closer to the sun. Okay, so what does that mean? That means when a planet is over here and it's far away, it can be moving pretty slow, okay? And we know that we take 365 days to make it around the sun. But we're moving along, we're moving along, okay? And then as we get closer to the sun, we're going to actually speed up, okay? So we're going to speed up a little bit. And then once we get back around the sun, we're going to go slower again, okay? So the closer a planet is to the sun, the faster it'll travel. And now what this means is that each area that is covered, so these little triangle shapes that are cut out, 
These are sweeping areas that are covered in equal time periods, okay? So it takes the same amount of time for the planet to get from this little sliver to this sliver. And then it covers the same amount of area from here to here. And then from here to here. So all of these triangles are just showing you a time period that the planet has moved. And it's also showing you the area that it swept through. Okay. All of these areas are equal. And all of them happen during equal time periods, okay? So here, on this end, on the left side, this planet is moving slower because it's further from the sun, okay? But And it's moving slower, but it's also further away. So it looks like it's long and slim, but it's actually this little blue triangle is going to have the same area as this pink triangle over here, okay? And the planet's moving faster or slower over here, and then it's moving faster when it gets to the sun. So even though the space in between the planet and the sun here is less, because it's moving faster, it will still cover the same area in the same amount of time, all right? So Kepler's second law, the planet travels faster when it's closest to the sun, and the planet will sweep equal areas in equal amounts of time. Okay, so all these triangles are the same area, and they all take the same amount of time for the planet to cover that amount of area. And there's an animation in here if you guys want to click it in your presentation. As always, your slides are linked, and you'll be able to pull that up and see it. Um, so we have to talk about something called a perihelion and an aphelion. Um, so the perihelion is the point at which a planet is closest to the sun. And then an aphelion is when a planet is the furthest point from the sun. So peri means close, okay? And a means away, okay? So a away and aphelion is when it's away from the sun. And peri means close, so a perihelion is going to be close to the sun. And then Healy, if we look at Healy, that just means in relation to the sun, okay? But the area swept is, again, the same, and we know that from Kepler's second law. I'm going to skip over this math because we don't have to worry about that, but it's just showing you the proof um, for the equal areas. So for our aphelion, in terms of our planet, remember A away when we're furthest from the sun, this is when we're 152 million kilometers from our sun, and this occurs about July 4th. So this past 4th of July, we on our planet, in our planet, we were the furthest point from the sun in our orbit for the year. Our perihelion is when we're closest to the sun. For us on Earth, that's when we're about 147 million kilometers from our sun, and this occurs on January 3rd. So. When we are on Christmas break this year, ringing in the new year, or I guess we'll be concluding our Christmas break, uh, when that happens, we will be um, at our perihelion closest to the sun. And Kepler's third law has to do with math. I don't want you to worry about the math. What I want you to know is that Kepler's third law states that the distance a planet is from the sun will affect how long it takes to revolve around the sun, which makes sense. So this is a ratio equation. You can use ratios to help determine this. So obviously, the further a planet is from the sun, the longer it's going to take for it to actually make that revolution around. So all you need to know for this is that the distance a planet is from the sun will affect how long it takes to revolve around the sun. Okay, so what does this mean? It means if we were doing the math or you were in an upper level, level physics course, you could use the equation to find out how long it takes for the planet to orbit the sun. Or if you knew how long it took a planet to orbit the sun, you could reversely use that equation to figure out the distance that the planet was from the sun. But all I need you guys to know in terms of third law is what is on the screen. Okay, so that does it for Kepler's Laws. If you have any questions, be sure to let me know. And if you have your notes done, you can go ahead and move on to your classwork for the day.